In this video, I'm going to cover entropy. Entropy is a thermodynamic function that increases as the number of energetically equivalent ways of arranging the components increases. So entropy is designated with an S, just like enthalpy is, is represented with an H. So one way to calculate entropy is that it's um, the Boltzmann constant K times the natural log of W, and W is the number of microstates, or the number of energetically equivalent ways a system can exist. So I know this is a, a kind of a mouthful here, but the, this, this term here, the number of energetically equivalent ways a system can exist, that's what we're going to dive into here a little bit. So um, just to uh, kind of review about enthalpy for a minute, So remember, enthalpy is um, the, the energy involved in the making and breaking of bonds. So enthalpy is represented with a capital H. The change in enthalpy is delta H, and this is generally measured in kilojoules per mole. So stronger bonds equals more stable molecules. Um, and when I'm creating a reaction uh, that's exothermic, I'm going from less stable bonds to more stable bonds, to stronger bonds. So a reaction is uh, generally endothermic if the bonds in the products are becoming weaker than the bonds in the reactants. So in order to weaken a bond, I have to add energy to it, which makes sense. So in an endothermic reaction, energy is being absorbed, and that energy is going to weaken the bonds between the reactants and the product. It's going into that potential energy between the atoms in a molecule. So when we think about enthalpy, when we think about H, we think about making bonds releases energy. So H is positive. And breaking bonds absorbs energy. So H is negative. And so when we're, actually, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. When energy is released, there's a negative sign, and when energy is absorbed, there's a positive sign. So um, when we're determining whether the change in enthalpy is going to be positive or negative, whether I'm going to get energy out of this process or whether this energy is going to this process is going to require energy, I have to think about how much energy was involved to break bonds and how much energy was involved to make bonds. And did it take more energy to break, or did I get more energy when I made new bonds? So those are the kinds of factors that we think about when we're thinking about the change in enthalpy, is the energy involved in making and breaking of bonds. So here's a process in determining whether this process is spontaneous. So dissolving salt in water, sodium chloride, is that process spontaneous? So remember, what spontaneous means is will this process occur without any outside intervention, without any outside energy? So when you put salt in water, will the salt dissolve? And yes, it will dissolve. So what factors are at play in making this a spontaneous process? So we have to think about enthalpy and entropy. Enthalpy is the energy involved in making and breaking bonds. So let's think about that first. These are bonded together. Plus and minus are stuck together. In order for plus and minus to be separated here when they're dissolved, energy has to be absorbed. Energy is absorbed to break this bond to separate these ions, plus and minus, like this. So that takes energy. It takes energy to break a bond. So right off the bat, this is an unfavorable process. This is taking energy from the environment, right? So then, when they're separated, I'm making bonds between water and the anion, right? These hydrogen atoms are making hydrogen bonds with the anion. These oxygen atoms are making hydrogen bonds with the cation. So I broke the ionic bonds, and I made some hydrogen bonds here. So I take energy to break these bonds apart, and I get energy back when I make these bonds here. So did it did I take energy? Did it, does it take more energy to break these apart, or do I get more energy back when I make these bonds? Well, we would have to look at a chart to determine 
which whether this process is endothermic or exothermic. Dissolving some salts is endothermic, which means this bond was stronger than these bonds. And dissolving some salts is exothermic, which means that this bond in the ion was weaker than these bonds that are being formed. So if I'm forming weaker bonds, then that's an endothermic process. If I'm forming stronger bonds, then that's an exothermic process. So that's one half of the spontaneity calculation. The other half is in entropy. So um, is, this an, an, is this favorable, this process favorable in terms of entropy? And entropy involves increasing the randomness or increasing the number of ways that a system can exist in equivalent ways, so what we call those microstates. So um, look at this solid here. It's very, very ordered. It goes purple, green, purple, green, purple, green, purple, green, purple, green, purple, green, and it has this perfectly, this perfect pattern that just repeats again and again and again. This is an incredibly ordered structure. It has very low randomness. It's not random. It's very ordered. So when I take this structure and I dissolve it, those particles are free to move around. They're not stuck together in this pattern anymore. And when they're free to move around, the randomness increases. So going from a solid to a dissolved substance, NaCl solid to NaCl aqueous, increases the entropy. So when we're thinking about whether or not a process is, is, uh, is spontaneous, we have to think about, is this, does it take energy to break bonds, or do I get more back when I make the bonds? That's one half. And does it get more random, or does it get less random? That's the other half. And we can put numbers to this. Was this exothermic or endothermic? By how many kilojoules per mole? Did this become more random or less random? By how many joules or how many kilojoules? And then we can add them together and we can determine whether or not the process is spontaneous. So what do we mean when we say microstates or different ways that a system can exist? So for me, the easiest way to think about this in terms of uh, an example that I think we can all wrap our heads around is thinking about a book. Let's say a book that has 500 pages, maybe your chemistry textbook, a really big book. Imagine what would happen if you took that book and you cut the binding off of it so that the pages were no longer bound together and you took the book and threw it way up in the air and all the pages kind of floated around and started, you know, going this way and that, and every, all the pages landed on the ground, and then you went about gathering them all up and, and putting them kind of, you know, front to back again in some kind of order as you gathered them up, and you flipped through the pages. What is the likelihood that those pages are going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in perfect order as they were before you threw the book? very very low the likelihood that they're going to be in the right order is almost zero and the reason is because there are so many possible ways that you could arrange those pages in div in the wrong order and there's only one way that you could arrange them in the right order there's only one right way it has to go one two three four five all the way up to 500. there's a virtual virtually an infinite number of ways that you can arrange them incorrectly. Even if, even so little as it goes one, two, three, five, four, six, seven, eight, and, and the rest of the pages are in perfect order, but five and four are switched around. Just one page was backwards. Well, that's wrong. So there are so many possible ways for the arrangement of pages to be wrong, and only one way for it to be right, that we say that those are energetically equivalent states for the book. The book doesn't really matter if they're if the pages are in order or not. You you mind if the book if the pages are in order or not because it's going to be hard to read if they're not in order. So um, the idea is that the more ways there are for you to arrange the pieces of a system, the pages in a book, or the particles in a flask. The more ways there are for you to arrange that system, the higher the entropy is. If there are lots of ways to arrange the particles in exactly equivalent ways, then the entropy in that system is very high. So this is very similar to what we were just looking at, right? Here is the book when it's in perfect order. The book in perfect order goes 
page one, two, three, four, purple, green, purple, green, purple, green, purple, green. This is a perfectly ordered book. And then I cut the binding off and throw it in the air, and all of the particles are randomly kind of thrown about in the solution. So there, and if I were to remove the water and try to put them back in exactly the same spot, they wouldn't go in exactly the same spot. They would probably go back in this arrangement, but they wouldn't go in the same spot they were in before. So this is my, my book with a binding, and this is my book without a binding. This is a good way to think about entropy. So here's another way. If I have two flasks that are separated by a, um, a way to s a close these, a stopcock, then if I have state A, all of the gas over here, and state B, all of the gas over here, and in state C, I have two particles here and two particles here. If we just look at this, and I'm looking at two flasks that have some gas particles in them, and this is open, the stopcock is open in all of these situations, what is the most likely way for this to exist? Probably state C. And you can think, you intuitively know that before you even think about entropy. If you have gas particles that are randomly bouncing around inside of any system, are all of those gas particles bound to be in one spot? Like if we're sitting in a room, in a classroom, do you have to worry about whether or not there's enough oxygen molecules in front of your face for you to breathe? Or are all of the oxygen molecules suddenly over there in that corner of the room and I can't breathe because there's no oxygen in front of me? Generally, in a gas, particles are spread out evenly. Right? So you don't have to worry about whether there's enough oxygen in front of you because there's enough oxygen in the room and it's all spread out evenly. So it's unlikely for all of the particles to gather in one spot. It's much more likely for all of the particles to be spread out. Think about when you're cooking. If you're cooking and you pour some salt or some pepper in your food as you cook and you stir it up, you pour it right in the middle and as you stir it up, it gets spread out. The salt gets spread out. Do you ever have to worry about the salt then gathering itself back up and suddenly becoming put in the middle of your food again? All of the salt kind of gets out of the spread out randomness that you had just you know, mixed it all up and it gathers itself up into a big pile in the middle of your food? Of course not. That doesn't happen because it's very unlikely for particles that are spread out to gather themselves up into a condensed area. It, that's a non-spontaneous process. It's very likely for particles that are in a, an organized fashion, a book, to get spread out. If you cut the binding off, they're going to get spread out and you're, they're not going to get put back together the right way. So this is what entropy is saying. Entropy is saying if you throw a book up in the air, you're probably not going to gather it up in the same way. So it's not really as mysterious as it sounds when you try to define it in terms of microstates. There are lots of ways for the book to be in the wrong order. There's only one way for the book to be in the right order. Therefore, it's far more likely to be disordered. Therefore, in a process that's moving in one direction, it's moving from order to disorder, just because there's so many possible ways for it to be disordered. So this, micro, or this macro state, state C, can be achieved through several different arrangements of the particles. So let's see what those arrangements are. So if I have four possible particles, um, and we, here we're just going to say that these particles are, we're going to keep track of them by their position. This is particle one, particle two, particle three, and particle four. So in this state C, where I have two in one and two in the other, I could have particle one and two here, and then particle three and four in this one. Or I could have particle one and three here, and particle two and four in this one. Or particle one and four here, and particle two and three in this one. It doesn't matter in what way I arrange those four particles, and there's lots of different ways that I can do it. Objectively, when I look at all of these different systems, they're all the same. Two in the left, two in the right. 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 So energetically, they're identical. They're just like books being in the wrong order. Here's the right order, one, two, three, four. And here's a bunch of wrong ways that you can position these pages, right? But they're energetically equivalent to each other. The book doesn't care if the pages are out of order. The flasks don't care if I have particle one, two, three, four, or particle one, three, two, four. To the flasks, those positions are equal. So 
because there are so many ways to arrange those particles like this, then this has more, it's more possible, it's more likely that four particles are going to take one of these arrangements. What are the other arrangements? Well, let's draw them in here really quick. Right, so then I have one, two, three, four. All of the particles in the left, two, oops, one, two, three, four, or all of the particles, I think I said left before, I mean left this time, all of the particles in the left, particle one, two, three, and four, or in the other state, all the particles in the right, particle one, two, three, and four. There's only one way to achieve this state. All four particles have to be in the right. There's only one way to do that. There's only one way to achieve this state. All four particles must be in the left. None can be over here. There are six different ways to achieve this state. Two in the left, two in the right. I can have these two in the left, or these two in the left, or these two in the left, or these two in the left. All of these are equivalent, and there's six of them. So if there are eight ways, let's say eight different ways to arrange these particles, and of course there's more than eight, because we're, we're not counting one over here and three over here, but let's say there are eight, these are the only eight ways that these particles could possibly ever exist. Which is the most likely way for them to exist? Well, it's, the likelihood is that they're going to be in one of these six states, six, six eights, right? So three quarters of the time, six over eight, they're going to be in one of these states. And only one eighth of the time they'll be over here, and only one eighth of the time they'll be over here. So therefore, the most likely place, the most likely way that those particles will be arranged is like this. That's all entropy is saying. What's the most likely way for the particles to be arranged if they can be mixed up and you can't really tell the difference? So that's what a microstate is. So macrostate is the four particles, this, this, and this. These are my macrostates. The microstates are giving them numbers, one, two, three, four. This is the only microstate that represents this macrostate. There's only one microstate that represents this macrostate, one, two, three, four. But there's six microstates that represent this macro state, one, two, and one, two. All six of these are equivalent. So there's a, this, this macro state has more micro states that are equivalent. So state C has the highest entropy. So we can give values of entropy, final entropy and the initial entropy and we can calculate the change in entropy, delta S. Entropy change is favorable when the result is a more random system, right? So, um, and uh, when we think about enthalpy, the heat going down, creating stronger bonds um, in an exothermic reaction, that's favorable. For entropy, what's favorable is when the system becomes more random. So when I'm creating stronger bonds and I'm getting more random, that's both of those factors are favorable. That's definitely a spontaneous process. But if I'm creating weaker bonds and the particles are becoming less random, then that's definitely not a spontaneous process because both of those are bad. If I'm creating stronger bonds and becoming less random, or I'm creating weaker bonds and becoming more random, then it's kind of mixed up and we've got to think about the, which effect is bigger. But in general, when I think about a change in entropy, Change in entropy is good when the entropy gets bigger. When the, it becomes more random, that's a favorable scenario, a favorable process. So some changes that increase the entropy are reactions whose products are in a more random state. So a solid is more ordered than a liquid. So if a process goes from solid to liquid, that increases the randomness. That increases the entropy. That's favorable. Reactions that have larger numbers of product molecules than reactant molecules. So if I, if I have a particle that falls apart, 
so I have one particle that turns into two particles as it breaks in half, that is uh, favorable in entropy because going from one particle to two particles is increasing the randomness, it's increasing the entropy, that's favorable. However, if I had two particles that are coming together to create one particle, that's bad for entropy, that's decreasing the randomness, that's unfavorable for entropy. So increasing the temperature makes particles go faster, when particles go faster, they spread out. When particles spread out, they can get more random. So increasing the temperature increases the entropy. Um, and solids dissociating, when they dissolve, when they spread apart, they become more random. It's just kind of like melting. So a process where the final condition is more random than the initial condition, then the entropy of the system, delta S of the system, is positive, And the entropy change is favorable for the process to be spontaneous. So the, the point here is that for any process to occur, it has to occur with an increase in entropy. So that's not to say that entropy increases every time anything happens. Sometimes when things happen, the entropy goes down. For example, if I freeze water into an ice cube, I have made the water molecules more ordered. I've decreased their randomness. Or if I take gas uh, steam, if I take some steam from water I boiled and I condense it, then I've turned that, that gas into liquid. So I have, it has become more ordered. Turning the liquid into a solid, it's become more ordered. That's decreasing the entropy. So when, when any liquid freezes into a solid, the entropy is decreasing. But that's not to say that entropy, that that process doesn't happen because of course we know that things freeze, things turn into solid all the time. So it's okay for um, this, the entropy of a system, of, for the entropy of a system to go down, to decrease, like when water freezes, as long as the entropy in the entire universe is going up. So when we're thinking about entropy, we can't just think about the system in isolation. And what I mean by that <coughs> is um, when liquid water freezes into an ice cube or an ice cube melts, it doesn't happen in the vacuum of space. When that liquid is freezing, it's probably freezing in your ice cube tray, which is in your freezer, and your freezer is in your house, and your house is in some geographic location that has certain weather, right? So. The process that we're thinking about is water freezing, making ice cubes. But that process doesn't occur in isolation. It occurs when, it, when that happens, it's, it's affecting the things that are around it, the other things that are in the freezer, for example. So when I'm thinking about entropy, I can't just think about the system. I have to think about the system and the surroundings. So we can see that in general, solid to liquid increases the entropy, and liquid to gas increases the entropy. And when I go the other way, I'm decreasing the entropy. So when a liquid freezes, then I, the entropy is going down. And that is totally a process that can and does occur all the time. So when we when we're talk about entropy, entropy in the universe must go up for all processes. All spontaneous processes occur with an increase in entropy. So... Um, the one way that we can represent that is to say that the, the entropy in the universe is equals the entropy in the system plus the entropy in the surroundings. So when the ice freezes and its entropy is decreasing, that's usually, that's usually accompanied by an increase in entropy in the surroundings. So the entropy in the ice cube tray decreases, but somehow the entropy in the freezer increases. And when that happens, we can see this is by how much the entropy in the ice cube tray decreased as that water froze into a more ordered form. And this is by how much the entropy in the freezer increased. And so when I add this and this together, there's a little bit, the, the entropy in the universe went up by a little tiny bit, right? So this is negative, this is positive, and the positive is bigger than the negative. So I have a little bit when I add them together, the delta S of the universe goes up a little bit. So 
this must be true for um, all spontaneous processes, that the entropy in the universe must increase. In fact, this is true for all processes, period, in the universe. In all processes, whether it's a spontaneous process or a non-spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. We cannot decrease the entropy of the universe. So um, when, uh, when I add together the entropy of the system and the surrounding, the entropy of the universe must always increase. That's, the, that's what the second law of thermodynamics says, is that the entropy in the universe is always increasing in every process. Therefore, adding these two together must give me a positive delta S in the universe. So when a system process is exothermic, so in terms of enthalpy, it's adding heat to the surroundings and it's increasing the heat of the surroundings. When a system is endothermic, it takes heat from the surroundings, and that decreases the entropy of the surroundings. The amount of the entropy of the surroundings changes depends on its original temperature. So let's think about it this way. When you have ice cubes, you've got these liquid particles of water. and those liquid particles of water are going to freeze into a solid ice cube. All right, so liquid water solid ice cube. In order for liquid water to turn into solid ice cube, it has to lose heat, right? Or Sometimes it's easier to think about it this way. In order for the ice cube to turn into water, it has to gain heat, right? Heat goes into the ice cube, and when heat goes into the ice cube, the bonds between the ice particles, between the water molecules break, and then I get a liquid, right? So let's think about the opposite process here for a minute. Let's think about when water freezes. So when water freezes, in order to turn into a solid, the water has too much energy. These particles are moving too fast for this to be ice. In order to be ice, the particles have to basically stop. So in water, the particles are moving too fast. In order to get them to stop, they lose energy. When they lose this energy as heat, this is heat, then they lose this energy as heat and they can turn into an ice cube, right? We'll think about the opposite is when the ice cube is getting heat, then it will melt, it will turn into water. So when the liquid water is losing heat and it turns into solid ice, is the entropy increasing or decreasing? Is it becoming more ordered or less ordered? So to go from liquid to ice is becoming more ordered. So delta S equals negative, which is a, a unfavorable, right? We want the entropy to increase. But when I heat is absorbed into an ice cube, absorb heat, and it moves this way, and I make water, that's increasing the randomness. So delta S is positive of the system. Sorry, delta S system. Delta S system. So we know that water can freeze into ice, and we know that ice can melt into water. So one of them has negative entropy, which we say is unfavorable. One of them has positive entropy, which we say is favorable. But yet both of these processes occur. So how is that, if, if the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy must always increase, then how do we have entropy decreasing? Well, the second law says that the entropy of the universe must always increase. And that's the system plus the surroundings. So when this heat leaves the water molecules, where does it go? Where is it going? Well, we don't really can we haven't considered that yet. 
but let's consider it now. This is our freezer. What is inside the freezer? Air particles, right? All of these air particles inside my freezer equals air. So I put my ice cube tray in the freezer. It's full of water, but the water starts losing heat. And as it loses heat, the water turns into ice. When that heat is lost, where does it go? It goes out here into the freezer. The freezer is full of air particles. What does this heat do to air particles? What does heat do to any particle? It speeds it up, right? So even though these are slowing down and they're becoming more ordered, when they lose heat, these air particles are speeding up. And what happens when a particle speeds up? It becomes less ordered. So although the system is decreasing in entropy here, the surroundings, delta S of the surroundings, are increasing in entropy. The air is getting more entropy as the ice gets less. And conversely, we can think about that here too. If ice melts, if ice is melting, then heat is going into it. Where is that heat coming from? It's coming from the air around it. When the air around the ice loses heat, because the heat is going into the ice, then the air around the ice gets colder. And what happens when it gets colder? It slows down. And what happens when it slows down? It becomes more ordered. So the entropy goes up. So, or excuse me, the entropy goes down for the air, as the entropy goes up for the ice. So you can see that any change that happens to a system is counteracted by a change that happens to the surroundings. They are uh, like yin and yang, right? For this to gain heat in the middle, the heat has to come from somewhere. So when the system gains heat, the surroundings lose heat. When the system loses heat, the surroundings gain heat. And so this change in entropy is just following the heat. When the heat goes out here, it increases the entropy in the air. When the heat goes in here, it increases the entropy in the water. So increasing entropy really just follows the heat. So we can see here, uh, at low temperature um, for water freezing, the, uh, the surroundings are kind of ordered already. We're at low temperature. So when the water loses heat to turn into ice, that heat goes into the surroundings that are cold, and it makes them more random. And when it makes them more random, the entropy increases, and we get a big change in entropy. Therefore, that process occurs when the air is cold. But what happens when the air is hot? Can I make water freeze when the air is hot, when it's above freezing? No. Why can't I make water freeze when it's above freezing? Because to make water freeze, the heat has to go somewhere, right? To make water freeze, the heat has to go somewhere. And the reason that the water is able to freeze is because when the heat goes there, it increases the entropy in the air. But what if the air is already really hot? When that heat goes into the air to make it hot to increase the entropy, it's not really increasing the entropy very much because the air already has a lot of entropy. So in order for ice to freeze, it has to lose heat. And when it loses heat, that heat has to increase the entropy somewhere. It only increases the entropy if the air is already cold at low temperature. So ice freezes spontaneously when it's cold, and ice doesn't freeze spontaneously when it's hot. Well, that's pretty intuitive, and we know that that's true, but this is why it's true. Because the same change in entropy in the system I can only offset that entropy change in the surroundings when the air is cold and the heat actually makes them more random. If the air is already hot and the heat doesn't make them more random, then the process can't occur because the entropy in the universe is not increasing. So when heat is added to the surroundings that are cool, it has more of an effect on the entropy. If the surroundings were already hot, then adding heat to them doesn't affect the entropy very much. 
Water freezes spontaneously below zero because the heat released on freezing increases the entropy of the surroundings, but above zero, the increase in entropy of the surroundings is insufficient to make delta S of the universe positive. So we can say, you know, qualitatively, whether we're going to increase or decrease entropy um, uh, in processes based on whether the particles become less or more random, but we can also quantify that and calculate it with numbers. So we have already talked about heat in uh, way back in chapter five, I think, thermochemistry. So remember, heat is represented with a Q. And so we talked a bit about heat of the system and the surroundings too when we were talking about calorimetry. So it turns out that we can calculate the change in the entropy of the surroundings based on the heat of the system, the, the uh, um, negative Q of the system divided by the temperature. So this is what we were just saying is the entropy increases, the entropy follows the heat. So entropy is based on where the heat goes. So entropy, delta S, is based on heat, Q, but it's also based on the temperature, because when it's really hot, the entropy doesn't increase much, but when it's colder, the entropy does increase more. So entropy, the delta S of the surroundings, is really a function of the heat divided by the temperature. And remember, heat is just another term for enthalpy, so the entropy is the enthalpy, the change in enthalpy divided by the temperature.